Hey everybody, welcome back. Today is Scripture Sunday, so I'm going to be going over two passages, one of which is from the Old Testament, one of which is from the New Testament. Now, I do not proclaim to be a pastor at all, but one thing I do like to pick out in Scripture, and any Scripture, but specifically the Bible, because I think it's the, the, the value there is just infinite in its depth. I like to point out patterns that I can see in Scripture, and so one of these that I've found, because I'm coming through the book of Deuteronomy, because one of the reasons that I really like the book of Deuteronomy, first of all, it's the most quoted book of the Bible by Jesus in the New Testament, so there's something about that then. Maybe we should pay attention to Deuteronomy a little bit above other things besides the prophecies or whatnot. The other thing about Deuteronomy is there's something in Deuteronomy that's a command to a king. It says, whenever you have a king, he shall sit down and write himself a copy of this book of the law and study it all of his days. I don't know if any king ever did that. Maybe they did. I'm just not sure. So maybe you are more enlightened on this topic. You can let me know in the comments below. Show me where to read. I like reading about this kind of stuff. So what I did was I made my own. I hand wrote the book of Deuteronomy in this book. And my kid just spilled coffee on it literally this morning. So, And I've been going through it. And so I hit this interesting passage. And I notice a familiarity here. This is Deuteronomy chapter 20. And it's talking about when Israel is to go against an enemy. Any any enemy, I guess. And they have not yet taken over all of the promised land per Joshua or Moses. Because Moses should be writing this technically. So it goes something like this. When thou goest out, then this is the old RSV version, so please bear with me for a bit, but it does make sense. It says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh into battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle, against your enemies. Let not your heart faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies, to save you. And the officers shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there that has built a new house, and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in battle, and another man dedicate it. What man is he that hath planted a vineyard, and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him go and Return into his house, lest he die in battle, and not another man eat of it. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife, and hath not taken her? Let him go and return into his house, lest he die in battle, and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return into his house, lest his brethren heart faint as well as his heart. And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. All right, so that's one part of it. So let's keep that in our mind. The second part of it is, it's a parable by Christ. It's called the parable of the great banquet. This is Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said unto Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet, invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. And the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant to go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the road and country lanes and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, none of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So do you see the similarities there? The similarities are the excuses. There's, they're kind of on the same par of excuses. One is in the Old Testament when you're about to fight a battle. The one in the New Testament is for a feast. So what does that tell you? So it tells you a couple of things, at least I think it does, and this is where you can get meaning and moral virtue from the Bible, but it, that's also readily apparent in life itself. So something like, you take the context, one is a battle, one is a feast. You need to know what you're fighting for in a battle. So if you don't know what you're fighting for yet, if you haven't reached that level, go home, know what you're fighting for. Whereas in a feast, there is no battle to be fought. So then, what should you do? You should honor the highest thing, which is the king, 
who's preparing something even better for you, even in times of peace. So it's all about substance and finding out what your the highest thing that you honor is. So until you go fight for something, you have to know what you're fighting for. But if there's no battle to be fought, you give thanks to the person who has kept the country safe. But the excuses are the same. So why is that important? Well, maybe sometimes when you're young and you're 16 and you say, I didn't know any better. But then you use the same excuse when you're like 36. Well, maybe a sense of maturity has, should have happened at that point. And some excuses just won't work in transitioning from youth to adult. You should have grown by then. You should have kids and be responsible for a castle, you know, like we are roughly in America. You have a house, you have an apartment, you have a car, you have a job, you have all these things, and you just do like one thing, you have one vocation. That's pretty substantial. So you should have grown by then and bettered yourself by then and figured out a better aim by then. The other thing it tells me is it's the power of affluence. It's hard to honor the highest thing or know what to honor when all of your needs are met. And when you're just looking to improve yourself and you don't know what the dark side is, you don't know what it actually looks like to have a terrible warlike environment. And that could be just as devastating as not knowing what you're fighting for because in the Old Testament it says, don't be fearful. Rather, it's gonna be scary in the fight. You need to have the proper motivation undergirding you to push you forward and face your fear because battle's terrifying and you need to know that, that your home, your family, your house, your structure, that is worth fighting for. And if you don't know that, you should go and learn it and live it. So that's something interesting that I just found out. I had no idea that that's where Christ pulled that stuff from because obviously he had to. A person who is the son of God and could debate scripture when he was 12 in the New Testament, he could certainly draw from the Old Testament into the New and use those quotations properly. So how does that help us? Well, it helps me anyway, and perhaps it helps you too. Sometimes when you look at these deep meaningful passages the idea that you're supposed to get out of it is the meaning not necessarily the details and the stories because the meaning can be more profound so i find myself looking at myself as like a third person perspective am i still using the same excuses that i used when i was 16 am i not progressing the way i should be am i not taking on projects and i know i should am i leaving some part of my house to stagnate instead of dealing with it am i not, am i not spending time with my kids when i know i should i'm too busy oh okay yeah that's it's all about me then it's not about them you know what i mean we gotta we gotta be careful with the excuses we've used for a long time because if you can name something that's holding you back if you can literally put a box around it this is my excuse then you know exactly what you have to do to deal with it you know exactly what you have to do to get around it or go through it. Or if it's holding you back that much, maybe you need to cut that part of you off. These are going to be brief. Again, I just noticed that pattern and I kind of wanted to share it with you. So I hope you got a little bit out of it. Once again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll, I'll see you next time. Take care.